Uh, the first bill we're going to hear is um, 1254. As many of you may remember, um, we had that bill last week. And uh, in that intervening week, I've been greatly distressed the way things have been portrayed. Um, the legislature has a lot of responsibilities. Most of us have lived long enough, been around the horn enough, educated enough to see very few things that are new under the sun. Um, one person's innovation uh, is usually replicated. Doesn't take too long. As far as electric vehicles, they've been around for almost 100 years. What's innovative in this discussion is how you market something. Um, and Indiana has had a pretty nice little loophole for that. And uh, we have tried to figure out how to bridge the differences between the, quote, the innovators and those that are already subjected to Indiana law. But because of the way it's been presented, as we know around here, perception becomes reality. Uh, so far in this discourse, GM's been the whipping boy. And uh, that has irritated me primarily because it's not true. Second, it's because I had a rich history of being in the automotive industry, and I know how that industry works. I've gotten calls that uh, I was tempted to play back to you and listen to the incivility from Tesla owners. Even had that here this morning. And um, I don't intend to put up with it. We are a civilized people. We have certain rules and regulations. And we are trying to make what we're doing here fair to all. But in the marketing world, there's what's called a rising star. And then there's the phase of a cash cow. And then you end up with a dog where it's no longer profitable and it goes away. But in this marketing innovation, we're going to find now that if we don't do something, I sat here a number of years ago, probably 12 years ago, when there was an outroar uh, on the internet and how it was decimating the marketplace. A lot of that's coming true. Uh, we've seen in this state literally hundreds of thousands of jobs disappear uh, because of some cases unfair trade practices, some wage unfairness, environmental rules, whatever it may be. But no one in this state wants to stop innovation. But we do want and always have tried to make a level playing field. We also try to protect the consumer. And uh, that's not easy to do sometimes. But I want to make it clear that I have heard from many, many manufacturers, not just General Motors. I've heard from my car dealers in my own district. I've heard from car dealers in other people's districts. If we go down this path, um, It'll be an interesting path to see how it unfolds. Because even those that are taking advantage of this new marketing strategy at some point may find themselves decimated by that own strategy from foreign countries. So with that as a background, I hope those who are here in attendance know that this committee and our caucuses have always tried to do what's right. The hallway doesn't always do what we view as fair. But as they say, all is fair in love and war. And in business world, sometimes it comes down to an economic war. So today, what we're going to do last week, this is kind of a first in the committees I've attended, we are going to unamend what we amended last week. Our caucus meant, and one of the things we do is as a committee chair, you listen to the will of your caucus because we want to make sure what we do is correct by the citizens of this state and those that supply employment in the state. So what's before the committee, this came late, we do not have the amendment in a drafted form. 
So I'm asking the committee that we put back this original language as it was when it came from the House. And we strip from this 1254 the amendment that was placed back in. Does the committee uh, understand what we're attempting to do here? It's highly unusual, but nonetheless, Senator Merritt. So as I understand correctly, we're having an in-committee uh, verbal amendment. Correct? That's correct. I'll make the motion. Second. It's moved, been moved and seconded. Do I uh, hear anyone saying we can take that by consent? Consent. consent. Okay, we have an unamended amended bill. So we're back to what came over from the House. It is strictly for anybody that may have any questions. It is a strictly summer study committee. I hope all parties can convey that to the world because I've heard from the world that they've been misunderstanding what we're doing here. So I'll repeat it once again. This bill before the committee is in its original version from the Senate, from the House, 1254, where we're taking how a product is marketed to a summer study committee. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I move House Bill 2054 as amended. It's not amended, uh, and we have yet, it's been unamended, so it's, it's interested how we will verbalize that. But we have testimony to take. If you remember, last week we took those that were in opposition to the bill. This week we are going to take from those that are in support of So, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, so, the people that are testifying, are they going to be testifying to the re-amended bill? Yes. Okay. All of them. They understand. All of them are aware of what we were okay. about to do. All right. Thank you, Marty Murphy. Please state your name and who you're with. Indiana taxpayers. When I started this job 10 years ago, there were 624 Indiana dealer rooftops. You won't have to think too hard to remember a location where an auto dealership used to be. We understand change and our industry has adapted. Every dealership has an internet sales manager now. We understand that the way people research their purchases has also changed. Our industry has adjusted with a reduced dealer network. We understand there are multiple resources of information that consumers count on to make their purchasing decisions. Our dealers spend thousands every year to provide sales and service training to their employees to constantly improve on the customer's experience. Our 21,000 plus dealership employees live here in Indiana, spend their paychecks here, and pay Indiana income and property taxes. Recently, Indiana made national news when an employer announced they were moving 1,400 jobs to Mexico. Now the state is doing everything they can to try to keep those family supporting jobs in Indiana. We understand how important good paying family jobs are to a community. If you want to say that the dealerships provide an extra layer of cost, we won't disagree, but we will say that layer is a critical value added benefit that provides local sales and service to your vehicle purchase that extends beyond the warranty period. High end vehicle dealers like Bentley, Maserati, Jaguar and Lotus each sold less than 200 new vehicles in Indiana last year, but they all still provided the local sales and service to their customers through the dealership model. They paid Indiana property taxes, collected Indiana sales taxes, and their employees lived here and spent their paychecks in Indiana. 
Franchise dealers are very active in their communities. They sponsor leagues, teams, they buy scoreboards for the high school. Franchise dealers are entrepreneurs too. They have a lot of skin in the game. They pay contractors to build and upgrade their dealership facilities regularly. They pay local media and internet media a lot of money for advertising. They pay good wages and they cause other companies to thrive, like work uniform providers, floor mat and mechanic rag laundry, bulk oil, paving companies, lighting companies, security systems, I could go on. Franchise dealers are the manufacturer's primary customers. The dealer buys the vehicles from the manufacturer to resell to consumers. Franchise dealers have multi-million dollar lines of credit to make these purchases and their dealership facilities are regularly upgraded to be appealing to the consumer and more functional. Our franchise dealers provide excellent customer service. They pick up and deliver customers. They provide loaner cars when needed. They keep their customers on the road. Finally, and maybe most importantly for consumers, franchise dealers promote competition in sales, and that benefits the consumer by providing options on where to make the best deal. Since it's been decided that we're going to study this issue further this summer, you can count on every one of the 384 franchise new vehicle dealers to reach out personally to their Indiana legislators to make certain all questions are answered and that all the benefits to Indiana consumers are well understood. I thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions of Marty from committee? I, I have one. Yes, Senator Bro. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you very much for that testimony. I, I found it very helpful. Um, I, I didn't really hadn't understood the scope of of the uh, dealer network, so I appreciate that. Um, do you have any ideas as to how a uh, new model between what is existing as as a member of the Dealers Association and and what Tesla is proposing? Have you given any thought as to how a model like that would could work together? Well, the, the simple, I mean, I have, I could give you 10 dealers that are already in the business that would be happy to be a Tesla dealer. I mean, it's a good product. They like the product. They just want them to sell it the same way they do. So, I mean, there are plenty of people that would like to okay, be a they, Tesla they, They've said that there, that there would be very little money to be made by a dealer in, in selling their vehicles. Would you, you, you refute that? Well, I, I would point to other high-end luxury or, or uh, uh sport vehicles that like Jaguar, Lotus, Maserati, they're all, you know, similar class vehicles and that all their dealers have been here for a long time and continue to do well. So I think it's possible. It's a business decision. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Jason Wetzel. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, committee. My name is Jason Wetzel. I'm Regional Manager of Public Policy for General Motors, and I'm here to speak on House Bill 1254, sponsored by Representative Mahan and offered by Senator Kenley. Um, to, uh, I've abbreviated my comments because realizing that the, the bill will be going to Summer Study Committee, but there's just a few points that I was hoping to make. And then, of course, there's some dealers here who I think will be able to speak to the uh, to the bill and the issue itself uh, from their perspective. For the last four decades, the Indiana legislature has recognized the important roles and investments of both manufacturers and dealers. As such, the legislature created a framework that regulates the activities of both groups. The legislature first enacted the state's automobile franchise laws in 1975, with a provision prohibiting direct sales by manufacturers added in 1999 and later amended in 2007. State franchise laws were created in part to protect consumers and provide them recourse if there are vehicle issues or recall events. When crafting these laws, however, the legislature only envisioned the two existing groups, manufacturers and franchise dealers, as those to which the laws would apply. The legislature could not have foreseen a time when newer manufacturers would use technology and a loophole in the state law to help circumvent rules governing the industry. So today we have companies like Fisker Karma, Dubuque Tomahawk, Faraday Futures, 
and many others who are looking to exploit this loophole that puts franchise dealers at a competitive disadvantage, while also undermining the laws that were created to protect consumers in the first place. And I think it's worth noting that Fisker, um, just to use them as an example, which it went bankrupt in 2013. It was quickly purchased by a Chinese company looking to sell electric cars across the world. And anyone familiar with the ch stories of Chinese uh, dumping millions of tons of steel on foreign shores can imagine how this scenario might play out. To be clear, we welcome competition from all manufacturers. We also believe that a free market dictates that all companies will operate within the same set of rules and we let the best companies succeed. We do not agree that one or two companies can argue the law doesn't apply to them simply because it doesn't fit their particular business model. We also disagree that a company should seek to be exempted from state laws by claiming that its product was innovative. You know, in 1903, the windshield wiper was innovative. I guess the makers of windshield wipers could have come forth and said this is a unique product. Uh, a few years later, the electric starter was produced and introduced. All of every product that we can think of was innovative at one time or another, especially right after it was introduced, and then it becomes standard. Being innovative is something that companies do to remain competitive and offer the best quality and safety to their customers. Innovation, however, by us or any manufacturer is not an excuse for circumventing the laws that govern an industry. Just because a company heavily invests in research and development does not mean that same company should operate under a different set of rules than its competitors. Whether a company makes an electric car, a gas-powered car, or one run by solar energy, the same basic rules should be ac applied across the board. In conclusion, the franchise dealer laws were created to ensure a level playing field exists among manufacturers and dealers. The franchise auto dealers provide a vital function by serving as the ombudsman between consumers and manufacturers. And they do this in a variety of ways that benefit the consumer. Indiana's consumer protection laws ultimately hold the dealer as the responsible party. And I think our dealers will be able to speak to that. But the ways our, our laws were crafted, the consumer is going to have a harder time seeking recourse if they didn't work through a franchise dealer just by the way the laws have been written. Without dealer involvement, consumer protections are ultimately eroded. House Bill 1254, as originally intended uh, before the, the recent amendments, would have updated and clarified the existing state law to protect consumers and ensure a robust and competitive marketplace that treats all participants the same. Mr. Chairman, uh, we appreciate your assistance on this issue and we appreciate the members of the committee uh, allowing us to speak on the bill. Uh, we also uh, like to thank um, Representative Mahan for his leadership on this bill. We look forward to continuing this discussion uh, with the legislature this year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Jason. Any uh, questions of Jason? Thank you. Thank you. Greg Hubler. Chairman Buck and members of the Senate Commerce and Technology Committee, my name is Greg Hubler, owner of Greg Hubler Chevrolet in Canby. I'm here today to speak of House Bill 1254, sponsored by Representative Mahan. HB 1254 would protect the integrity of the franchise system that benefits consumers while also ensuring a level playing field for all auto dealers doing business in Indiana. The Hubler family has been in the automotive business for nearly five decades. The Hubler family has in all seven GM facilities and a total of 11 franchise stores owned by various family members operating in central Indiana. We are one of the largest GM families in the state. And in the past two years, my wife Heidi and I purchased our existing Chevrolet store in Canby, and my sister Christy was granted a new Chevrolet point in Crawfordsville. All six of these GM facilities are EBE, which is manufacturer compliant, and the seventh is currently under construction. The Hubler family in total, in total employs nearly 600 Hoosiers throughout their 11 facilities. To be in business as long as we have been and to get the size, one has to take care of the customer, even for the unexpected. What do you do when you have a massive recall? It happens to all manufacturers. GM, Toyota, and Volkswagen have all experienced this as have many others. If you're a dealer, 
You usually live in that community and will do everything possible to make it right because your reputation is at stake. I see from the website that Tesla currently has a voluntary recall on front safety belts for their Model S. They recommend that you take the vehicle and have it serviced at the nearest center. If you live in Indiana, you have to drive to Chicago or Cincinnati to get it fixed. It's a three hour commute just to get a safety feature taken care of. That would not happen if you had a dealer in the Indianapolis area. I'm not against any new manufacturing entering the marketplace. In fact, I'm guessing there are many dealers who would like to expand their product offerings. Several times the manufacturer has tried to sell direct to the customer, but it's always been a failure. We have franchise laws in place for a reason. Everyone abides by them and it works. Even high-end companies with lower sales volume and market shares like Porsche or Bentley follow the same laws in place. If we allow one manufacturer a different set of rules, the entire system will start to fail and it just doesn't work well. During the recent bailout, it would have been an absolute mess without dealers. Indiana's deal dealer franchise laws were created to protect consumers and dealers alike and they, they should be applied in the same fashion for all dealers and manufacturers of motor vehicles. Allowing a company to circumvent Indiana franchise law undermines fairness, distorts the free market, and promotes an unfair competition that benefits a single competitor. We have no issue with competing against any company entering into the automotive market. So as long as they play by the same rules that we have been following and all seek to do so. Moreover, we believe that it is imperative to protect the integrity of the dealer franchise system, a system that has long worked and benefited both Hoosiers and consumers for decades. We look forward to the continued study of House Bill 1254. Chairman Buck and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to, to testify. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Craig. Any questions? Yes, Senator Houchin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for your testimony. Uh, my question is, you said you had 11 franchise stores? Within the Hubler family. Within the Hubler family. Yes. How many employees? Um, uh, approximately 600. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, Senator Bro. Thank, thank you, sir. And I'm not sure that you're the person to answer this, and maybe it's over the summer um, if I serve on that committee, but I keep hearing level playing field and competitive advantage and disadvantage. Can there be more specifics given as to what that means exactly when you say a level playing field? How is it unlevel, and what are the advantages or the disadvantages? Can you help with that or somebody down the road or at some point in the future? I'd like to know. I think more of that will be brought to light in the summer study, but, you know, basically just uh, we, we ask that these manufacturers just build the same facilities and, you know, allow the same competition amongst the dealer body that we have, most simply put. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Craig. Appreciate you being here. Christy Hubler, and you'll have to help me with your uh, last name. I apologize. Lots. Good morning, all. Chairman Buck and members of the Senate Commerce and Technology Committee, my name is Christy Hubler Liscava, owner of Christy Hubler Chevrolet in Crawfordsville. I'm here today to speak about House Bill 1254, sponsored by Representative Mann, Mahan, excuse me. House Bill 1254 maintains a business model that has proven effective for decades. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the local and national dealer community as we urge you to support this bill. With respect to everyone's time, I'd like to state some facts about the impact of a franchise dealership as recorded by the National Auto Dealers Association. 17,800 represents the dealer network nationally. 96% of the country's new car dealerships are locally and privately owned. Over $200 billion have been invested collectively by us dealers, signing and committing our lives financially to comply with franchise requirements. 
More than one million people are employed by new car dealers with an average annual income of $53,000. Over 15% of state and local tax revenue is generated by local dealerships. That's $700 billion plus dollars in revenue and more than $13 billion tax dollars generated. What is different about a car purchase that requires the presence of a dealership as opposed to a direct-to-consumer purchase, you may ask? You may think in an era where most everything can be purchased online, why can't I buy a vehicle the same way? Vehicles are a highly regulated good at every step in the manufacturing, buying, operating, and servicing, as well as repairing processes. For instance, you must have a state ID or driver's, or excuse me, a state issued driver's license to drive one. You must carry insurance regulated by a state government agency. And with over 85% of purchases that require financing, consumers' credit must be handled accordingly and is regulated as well by state and federal government agencies. 60% of trade-ins are involved and given a value during a new car purchase, with lean payoffs and highly complex transactions included. Cars require maintenance by technicians, often licensed by state and government agencies because of the safety implications of their work. Hazardous materials are found in cars, which must be handled and disposed of properly. If a car is operated incorrectly or even just maintained poorly, people can be hurt or even killed. I ask you this, does that, same the sound, does that sound the same as a shirt you may purchase online? For decades, a dealership has been a convenient source for a customer to test drive a new vehicle, maintain their current vehicle, and to complete manufacturer warranty and recall work. The ability of a consumer to compare different dealerships while shopping for a vehicle keeps prices competitive and low. The inevitable additional costs and fees associated with purchasing a new vehicle are also kept to a minimum by having dealers compete for your sales and service business. With a laundry list of reasons why franchise laws are a good thing, why exactly are we here? There have been multiple manufacturers that have desired a revision to the current business model. These manufacturers want exceptions to be made to the current franchise laws that have been in effect for decades. Every past attempt of these exception seekers has, has ended in failure. The presence of a franchise law is to merely safe house customers, dealers, and manufacturers alike. Again, the business model has been proven to work. I leave you with this. Last year, manufacturers sold 18 million new vehicles across the US. One of these manufacturers, by the name of Tesla Motors, sold 90,000 vehicles. Is the integrity of the franchise system willing to be put at stake for the exception seekers, representing half of a percent of the U.S. sales? All we are asking is to maintain a fair open market, where everyone, is abide, everyone has to abide by the same rules that have been proven efficient and effective for all. If Tesla, or any other manufacturer for that matter, wishes to become an equal by franchising alongside our dealer network, network, we welcome the competition by all means. We look forward to continuing the conversation during the summer session of House Bill 1254. Chairman Buck and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Christy, appreciate you being here. Senator Toms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, this question I could have asked of anybody. I, I just, just listened to you testify. Thank you, it made me think about this. As a dealer, would you would you be willing to take a Tesla as a trade-in? I'm just curious because I have a reason for it, but I, I could have asked of anybody, maybe Marty. I would as a dealer, would you accept one of those as a trade-in? That's a really good question. Whenever it comes down to it, there's a lot of things that are um, there are a lot of things that we're liable for. For instance, if we take that into our service department and try to do reconditioning work. We don't have the tools, we don't have the, the technology to even work on it. Mm -hmm. Same thing if we sell that vehicle in our community, we want that customer to come back to us and service. That's how the business works. We don't know how to service that vehicle because that's what a dealership body does. We learn, we train, we focus to make sure that we're doing everything that we can that benefits the customer. Sure. I would take in a Tesla. I have no idea what I would put as value on it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that Tesla does either. And that's another thing that's a major issue. They're currently leasing Teslas. Let's say 36 months down the road, all of these individuals that have leased a Tesla, they calculate what the residual value is incorrectly. That in itself is a billion-dollar mistake. 
Can a company that is that small, that's privately owned, absorb something like that? And how many years in a row will it take? At the end of the day, it's the consumer that loses. At the end of the day, they spend $150,000 on a vehicle that may be worth nothing. Well, appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Christy. Appreciate your being here. Tom Kelly. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to talk on House Bill 1254. My name is Tom Kelly. I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, our company was started 63 years ago. I started in 1974. I hate to admit it's 42 years ago. Uh, we have 550 employees. We have six franchises in six different locations in the Fort Wayne area. Um, we uh, have a payroll of about $20 million a year. Uh, last year, I collected $10 million on behalf of the state and sales tax. Um, and uh, we enjoy the car business. And th to me, this is not about Tesla. This is about bigger issues. I spent 10 days in China in 2009. Roger Penske was trying to buy Saturn from General Motors and uh, asked me to go on a clandestine mission over there and talk to Brilliance, which is a company we'd become familiar with. Brilliance builds all the BMWs that are made in China. At that time, they were. And they were interested in entering the U.S. market. And so I met with the uh, chairman of Brilliance, who was a Communist Party committee member. And uh, he made it very clear to me. He said, Tom, if we want to sell 100,000 of this particular model in the United States, you tell me what price I got to price the car at, and I'll price it at that. He said, our model does not allow us to lay people off in China, and so therefore we're going to continue to produce these vehicles. Now, Keith Bussey, my business partner, who is chairman of Steel Dynamics in Fort Wayne, uh, will tell you very candidly what the Chinese have done to the steel business. China's current steel production is 800 million tons a year. They currently consume 350 million tons a year. They are exporting 450 million tons a year of steel at a severe discount. In the last quarter of last year, Steel Dynamics in Fort Wayne was the only steel company in the United States to make money. That's because they have a very lean manufacturing system. My concern is that if the Chinese have a very easy entry into the U.S. market, they will take advantage of it. They might sell 100,000 cars one year, 500 the next, 200 the next, and uh, it would be very detrimental to the U.S. automobile business. Uh, with a dealer network, they have to be much more careful in how they do that. It takes more time, more vetting, and the dealers are the consumer's advocate. We have 50,000 customers in the Fort Wayne area that drive our vehicles. Those are called units in operation. I have 200 brand new loaner cars that I loan out every day to customers when they need a car. We do same day service. If we can't fix your car in the same day, we will loan you a car free of charge. Um, I'm more concerned about the Chinese and people from India bringing cars to the United States if they have an easy access to do that. The other concern I have, I'm a member of the Motor Vehicle Advisory Board. I serve at the pleasure of Connie Lawson, and our job is to advise her and her department on issues that involve motor vehicles, boats, scrap yards, auto auctions, and the, license, and the licensing and the laws that affect such. We had a meeting two weeks ago, Senator Cruz was there, and the big issue we have is that all the language that we have put forth in the last number of years regarding franchise laws and dealers uses the term new car dealer. It does not mention manufacturer. We believe that a manufacturer selling vehicles in the state of Indiana with no dealer body is exempt from those laws at the current period of time. And that is a big concern. In fact, Senator Cruz and I talked about it last night. He says, you mean if we let this go on, we're going to have to go back and change all that language? I said, Senator, you know, that's for the lawyers to determine. But I, as a member of that committee, am concerned that the laws that say, hey, I'll deliver a title to you in 31 days from the time you take delivery of your car, how I handle the transaction, all the ethical issues that I have to deal with are not applicable to a manufacturer who does not reside in the state of Indiana and does not have a dealer, is not a new car dealer in the state of Indiana. The other issue is sales tax. When we sell a car, we collect sales tax. At the instant we sell that car, we forward that to the state of Indiana. As I said, we collected about $10 million in sales tax last year. If you are out of state and you sell a car in state, you do not need to collect sales tax. It's up to the individual when they register that car and get their license plates to pay sales tax at that moment. So one of the concerns would be just the cash flow to the state of Indiana if you have a 30 or 40 day lag time. The other issue is I know many a customer 
either unintentionally or intentionally never registered their car. So that means they never paid sales tax on that transaction. So I think that's an issue that would have to be addressed, how sales tax is collected on these car sales, and also how the consumer protection laws as put forth through the Secretary of State's office would be applied in those instances. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to participating in the summer study, and I'm open to any questions that any of you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Uh, having been in China, I, I've, this has been one of my concerns for about a year and a half when I got involved over on 86th Street. If we do not rein in internet sales of vehicles, is it not possible those very people you've talked to could sell vehicles in China on the internet, ship them to the states, deliver them in the driveway, and who's going to be the wiser? Uh, I think that's very true, and unfortunately, the, the safety regulations of cars are up to the manufacturer to prove those standards. It's up to General Motors, Toyota, Honda do the crash test and do all that. And the government comes afterwards and says, okay, your car does not comply, we're going to fine you or whatever. So I believe, you know, 100,000 cars could show up at the Port of Los Angeles and those cars could be shipped to consumers in the United States. And, you know, I've heard the term, well, let the buyer beware. Well, I don't know that we want to put ourselves in that position. Any other questions? Thank you for being here, Tom. Thank Look you Look forward much. to working with you. Representative Mahan, would you like to close? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a state lawmaker who comes from the third smallest county in the state of Indiana, who does not have a GM manufacturing plant in his district, and I want to repeat that again because some people don't seem to want to believe that, who does not have a GM manufacturer, nor any automobile manufacturer in my district at all, who has been the national target of very disingenuous uh, presentations and comments, uh, both here and in the committee or in the, in the media, I have decided to, uh, I don't normally read. Uh, but uh, at the risk of uh, I don't want to say something I may regret later, uh, if you would just indulge me for just about five minutes, I would like to just re read a prepared statement that I have. I know time is very important to you. So it is very important to me as the sponsor of House Bill 1254 that we clear up some misconceptions as we lay the path for a summer study committee on this issue. 1254 would not have put a single company out of business in Indiana. In fact, it would have ensured that Indiana's 384 new car dealers and the 40,000 jobs they support are able to remain competitive. We heard from an opponent to the bill that the bill would have ended their ability to do business in Indiana. Let's be clear, that would have been their choice not to comply with the proposal. Every day, 384 dealers comply with Indiana law, as do over a dozen manufacturers, and yet a single company said that it wouldn't work for them because it doesn't fit their business model. We have heard time and again of jobs leaving our state. House Bill 1254 would have helped protect those jobs in our own community while also establishing a path of a new company to build a nexus here. We're not talking about renting space in a mall, but having a real nexus that benefits consumers and also creates jobs. Indiana lawmakers saw good reason to prohibit manufacturers from selling directly to consumers. Yes, they did not want a manufacturer competing with its dealers. But equally important, lawmakers realized that consumer protections were dependent on having franchise dealers, local businesses, as the middlemen in their system. It's no accident that Indiana's franchise laws hold the dealer, not the manufacturer, accountable for consumer protection measures. The original purpose of providing a manufacturer with a license 
to consumers, or to sell to consumers, that it would be used for unique circumstances, such as if the dealer passed away or committed a serious crime. In those instances, the manufacturer could temporarily assume responsibilities for serving customers while they searched for a new qualified dealer to take ownership of the business. At that point, the manufacturer would relinquish the license and the new dealer would sell the cars. The legislature never envisioned that a manufacturer would enter the market and use the license as Tesla has done and others are sure to follow. House Bill 1254 sought to address and resolve this unintended use of the manufacturer's license. I also want to add that this bill was never a fight, in my opinion, between GM and Tesla. GM and Ford have supported this bill with the primary reason of supporting their dealer partners. This bill was never really about Tesla either. There are plenty of companies like Tesla planning or in the process of coming to market using the same business model and similar products. Companies like Fisker Karma, Duke Tomahawk, and Faraday Futures are just a few uh, of the names. We have heard that 1254 is anti-free market. Let's be clear, a truly free market would have no rules or regulations whatsoever. The antithesis of a free market is what China has, where the government supports and controls all market conditions across the supply chain. The American free market is based on the premise that all companies, large and small, compete under the same rules and conditions. Within that framework, they are free to run their business as they see fit. In other words, the government doesn't pick winners and losers, but it also doesn't allow a free-for-all. House Bill 1254, as originally intended, is pro-free market. It sets an even bar for all manufacturers and dealers to compete on the same level ground. One other thought on the free market. When two companies compete, it is ultimately the consumer who wins from a competitive pricing standpoint. I can think of no better scenario for Indiana consumers than to have at least two Tesla dealerships competing on price. I've been asked, why doesn't Ford or Toyota or GM just open up their own dealership uh, away from their own dealers? They could do it, right, under the law? Well, the short answer is no, they can't. Indiana law prohibits a manufacturer from competing against a dealer within the same relevant market area for any of the products or service offered by a dealer. Having just one dealership in the state is enough to trigger that prohibition in most cases because people are willing to travel great distances to buy a car. History has already given us a real world example of when Ford was told to shut down its stores because they competed with Ford dealerships across the state. I will also say that I've heard some make the argument that if the consumer wants to buy an expensive car and it breaks down on them, like all machines do, then it's the buyer's problem. Buyers beware has been the catch line used. I have to say I've been a little stunned by this rationale. Our society is based on the rule of law. We regulate restaurants to keep people healthy. We regulate our roads and highways to ensure the safety of motorists. We regulate banking and commerce to protect consumers. Yes, consumers take risk when they buy a product, but legislators have, have built in protections to aid the consumer in seeking recourse, especially for more expensive purchases like homes and automobiles. The buyer beware argument is especially flawed when we consider the thousands of families that may have only one vehicle that they depend on to go to work or school. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your work on this and the committee indulging us on this. As we study this, I guess in closing, what I would like to say is what I've reiterated all the time. I hope Tesla comes and manufactures automobiles here. I welcome them here. I want them here. And while we're studying this issue over the next year, since they want to be involved in the state of Indiana, I look forward to them joining our chambers of commerce, them supporting our local little leagues, and our football leagues, and also supporting our academics 
uh, at the high school level and the college level, like what we see from all the other manufacturers all throughout our community. And that's a challenge I guess I would put out to Tesla, is you want to be a community partner here. I look forward to that happening in the interim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Mahan. Any questions? Thank you so much. Uh, any discussion amongst the committee? Senator Delph? Mr. Chairman, I move House Bill 1254 as unamended. Do I hear a second? It's been moved and seconded. Call the roll. Senator Bro. Um, just to explain my vote, I, I just want to say that this has been uh, a very fascinating conversation. I think there are um, many items to be considered and discussed, and I hope that uh, as a committee uh, we actually do undertake a study of this uh, issue over the summer. I vote aye in favor of this uh, particular bill as it stands. Senator Broden? Yes. Senator Randolph? Senator Merritt? Senator Delph? Yes. Senator Head? Yes. Senator Houchin? Yes. Senator Lysing? Yes. Senator Toms? I'd like to explain my vote if I can. I just want to take a minute here to thank Senator Bug for all the work he put in on this measure because I know he worked hard navigating this thing through the system. And for everybody in this room, everybody on this committee has been studying this and thinking it through very hard. And I'm going to tell you that I appreciate the conversation I had in Senator Buck's office yesterday. In fact, at 3.55 in the morning yesterday, this is what I was laying in bed, looking at the clock, thinking about this bill. And he told me at 4 o'clock he was doing the same thing. <laughs> My wife, who was in here last week, um, we talked about this all the way back home to Evansville. That's three hours of testimony in a car with your wife. <laughs> this is a serious matter, and I am glad it's going to a summer study because listen to all of the discussion. You guys have all made good points on both sides. And I think that uh, we're doing the right thing here that lets everybody have the time to put everything together. And I do believe that somewhere out there is an agreement that would be suitable for everybody. I do believe that. And thanks again, Senator Buck, for all the work you've done on this. I vote yes. And Senator Buck. Explain my vote. Um, a year and a half ago, we went through where China was dumping mopeds and ATVs in Indiana. And if Indiana doesn't do something with this, you're going to see China dumping automobiles. And so if you want to ignore the uncompetitive marketplace called China, you do so at your own peril. Your family's peril, your neighbor's peril, your employer's peril. We have to do something. I pray to God that we take the Summer Study Committee seriously and get down to something that all parties can live with. I vote aye. That's nine in favor, none opposed. Thank you. We will now move on 